Welcome to UCL's Lunch Hour Lecture Series. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stacey Bryan, who's going to be talking to us about cancer of the vulva. She'll be talking for about half an hour, and then we'll have a time for questions at the end. If I could just ask you to save up your questions for the end, please, and use uh, the microphones. We'll give you handheld roving microphones to ask your questions at the end, if you'd like to. So Stacy is a uh, junior doctor. She's nearing the end of her general training, and she's doing what many of us have had to do over the years, which is to do uh, some research along the way. And Stacy is currently working with me on a potential blood test for cervical cancer. But today she's going to be hopefully educating you and stimulating you about a different subject, cancer of the vulva. It's a very taboo subject, and we want everyone to talk about this more because we feel that that way some tragedies can be avoided. So without further ado, over to you, Stacey. Thank you. Can I just double check everyone can hear me? Sticky at the back, yeah? Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, just firstly, thank you all for giving up your lunchtime to come and um, listen to this talk on cancer of the vulva. As Adam said, I'm Stacey, I'm one of the obstetrics and gynaecology um, registrars, but at the moment doing um, a research project and working as a gynaecology oncology um, fellow. Um, so firstly, just to say that not all of my images will be as pretty as these cupcake vulva images, just as a word of warning. I will be showing images of normal vulva and abnormal vulva as well. Um, before I do flag up any of the images, I will, I will say, so anyone who may be feeling squeamish, um, feel free to sort of look away um, at that point in time. This image is actually taken from a leaflet that was developed by um, one of our nurse specialists and one of the um, obstetrics and gynaecology fellows last year, um, just to help young people be more aware of the vulva. And it was at a time where you know, younger women were asking for labioplasties, you know, um, um, procedures to alter the shape of the vulva, even though they were absolutely normal. So it was more of a drive and a leaflet of a pamphlet just to say, look, this is actually normal and there's no need for these things. So just to start, why this topic? Well, basically, vulval cancer is quite a rare cancer. There is little known about it. Um, and as we've already heard as well, there is a taboo generally surrounding the discussions about the female genitalia. And we want to try and open up these discuss discussions, basically, by this talk today. And a combination of the first two, um, it often leads to, leads to delays in diagnosis because people aren't talking about symptoms that they have, so they're not presenting to healthcare professionals, so often presenting quite late, unfortunately. So the objectives of the talk over the next half an hour or so is firstly to look at the anatomy of the vulva, um, then some images about what is a normal vulva, what does a normal vulva look like. Once we know what's normal, we can then work out what is abnormal. Um, what the causes of vulval cancer may be, some of the symptoms that a woman may experience and the appearance of the vulva if there is a cancer. How do we treat vulval cancer? And also, is it possible to even prevent it in the first place? So anatomy of the vulva, don't worry, this is a diagram, not one of the images. Um, so firstly, just to start with, um, colloquially, the external or the female genitalia is known as the vagina. Um, well, actually, the vagina is the innermost portion or the internal portion of the external genitalia, and what you see on the outside is the vulva. Um, so just starting from the top, really, I'm hoping you can see this pointer, yeah. Um, so the mons pubis is essentially a layer of sort of fat skin in here on the top of the pubic bone, just at the top of the um, external genitalia. And extending down from that on either, oops, on either side... Um, is the labia majora. When I say labia, it's interchangeable with vulva as well. So labia or vulva, pretty much the same thing. So the labia majora or the outer lips, um, outer labia, um, is, is um, on the outside and an extension of the mons pubis, um, all the way down to the perineum, which is that short space between the vagina and the back passage, the anus. Um, often covered with hair and, as I said, a layer of fat and skin as well. Moving more um, internally, there's a thinner fold of skin, the labia minora, or the inner lips of the labia, um, which join at the top to form the clitoris, which is synonymous with the um, erectile tissue that you find in the penis. And then, of course, the vaginal opening in the middle of that. And just above that is the urethra, or basically where urine is passed through. Um, so that's the essential basic anatomy of, of the vulva and what we talk about when we're speaking about the vulva. 
So what is normal? Um, now, this is um, one of the panel of 10 panels from um, The Great Wall of Vagina by an art artist called Jamie McCartney. Um, and this work is, was found, was exhibited in a museum in Milan. I mean, he's even guilty of using the word vagina when actually it's vulvas that we're, that we're seeing. Um, as I said, it's one of 10 panels. Each panel is about 40 women. It's about 400 women in total had volunteered to, for sculptures made of the, of the vulva. And what I wanted to do with this image is just to point out that there's many different shapes and sizes which are absolutely normal of the vulva. Um, you've got here, for example, someone that doesn't necessarily have prominent um, labia or prominent vulva here and here. You've got someone that's got a bit more prominent um, inner labia or uh, labia minora. And then you've got, you know, some ladies who've got prominent and clitoris. You've got a couple of piercings here as well. But it's just to say that it's a different variety of, of shapes and sizes, um, maybe asymmetrical, but again, completely, absolutely normal. Now, what does that look like in real life, so to speak? So um, next image is just a photograph images of, um, of vulvas as well. So just showing you the different ethnicities and again, pointing out some may not have obvious um, vulvas or labias. Some have more um, prominent labias, prominent clitoris. Again, all absolutely normal um, images. So now we know what is normal, <coughs> what does abnormal look like? Again, this is um, an example of one of the images that I will show if you don't feel like, uh, or feel a little bit squeamish, then please look away now. So the first image is what we call lichen sclerosis. So lichen sclerosis is an inflammatory, chronic inflammatory disorder, mainly of older women, um, characterized by really intense itching. We often treat it with steroid cream just to help to dampen down the inflammation. Um, it can't unfortunately be cured totally, but certainly can be managed. Um, and it's characterized by that white kind of area um, on the vulva. And often what we get is fusion of the two parts of the vulva, the inner and the outer um, vulva. Um, and that's typical of this lichen sclerosis. As I said, a chronic inflammatory condition. The next image is of vulval warts. So just as you may get warts of the skin, of the finger, of the bottom of the foot of Veruca, um, you can have warts of the vulva as well. Now, warts are typically caused by HPV, human papilloma virus. You may have heard of HPV in the context of cervical cancer. Um, I will go into it a little bit more um, later into the talk with the differences between the two. The next image is what we call Paget's disease. Um, so this is... It's almost like a manifestation of a different type of cancer in a similar area that affects the deeper layers um, of the skin of the, of the vulva. Um, you do get Paget's disease of the breast as well. Um, but this one of the vulva is what we call extra mammary or outside of the breast Paget's disease. It's a rare disorder, but we do, we do see it sometimes in the vulva. And the last image is, just, is of a vulval abscess. So again, in the same um, way that you can have an abscess or a boil on the skin, um, so it's a collection of pus and fluid within the vulva underneath that skin. Um, can be quite red, quite hot. It presents as a lump, um, typically on one side. And what would need to happen here is either under local general anaesthetic, a small cut is made over the, um, the lump and the pus expressed and antibiotics given and, and patient treated in that um, sense. So moving on to vulval cancer itself, um, it does tend to be a cancer of ladies who are older, so over the age of 65. Although we are starting to see a smaller group or cohort um, of women under the age of 50 um, who are developing vulval cancer, and we think that's down to HPV infection. Again, I'll go on to, um, to speak a little bit more about HPV a bit later. As we said, it is rare. Over 1,000 women are diagnosed each year in the UK. So this is more to just bring awareness to it. So what are the possible causes? Human papillomavirus infection, HPV, thought to be more in younger women. It may occur in the context of lichen sclerosis, if you remember that first um, picture of the abnormal vulva, so that inflammatory um, condition, which occurs in older women. And about 5% of these um, women will go on to develop a cancer. And then the others, I briefly mentioned Paget's disease already. Melanoma, again, a cancer from a, a mole or a skin pigmentation. Again, as you would get melanoma of the skin from the sunlight, you can have the same thing from the vulva. Um, a basal cell carcinoma, again, is a different type of skin cancer. 
and you can get cancer of the Bartholin's gland. Now, the Bartholin's glands are glands that sit inside the vagina, help with lubrication, and you can unfortunately get the cancer there. All of those in the third block are all uh, more rare um, causes of vulval cancer. So what is HPV? I have mentioned it a few times. So it is a virus that affects the skin and mucous membranes. And what I mean by mucous membranes, it's sort of the moisture area. So um, the oral cavity in the mouth is an example of mucous membranes, or um, the lining of the mouth is an example of the mucous membranes. Of course, the vagina, the cervix, um, the back passage as well are all um, examples of mucous membranes, and therefore areas in which HPV can affect. So there are multiple different subtypes of HPV. Um, HPV 16 and 18 are the ones that are which we call high risk, so they're thought to cause cancer. Um, and HPV 6 and 11 are what we call um, the lower risk, or the ones not likely to cause cancer, but more so the warts, again, the pictures that I showed um, in the earlier slides. And about 30 to 40% of high risk HPV, so 16 and 18, are found in um, vulval cancers. It is spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, sexually transmitted, I've got in the inverted commas, because it's not sexually transmitted in the sense where you think of gonorrhea, chlamydia, those sorts of infections, but certainly by intercourse um, and genital contact, it can be spread. Um, it can be spread by hand genital contact and it's also spread by oral genital contact as well. So how does HPV actually cause cancer? So um, it interacts basically with the cells, the, 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 the cells within your own body, um, can cause precancerous changes, which if left untreated, can go on and, and lead to cancer. As we mentioned, does affect younger women, and it can lay dormant for many years, i.e. a woman can have HPV infection and it's not causing any, any problems, it's just there within the cells. Now, the majority of women who do have HPV infection will clear the infection, about 80% of women, and that's if they have a good immune response, so the body's fighting off these infections. Um, sometimes these infections persist, and that's what causes the precancers, and then later on cancer if not treated. So the thing about vulval cancer, similar to cervical cancer as well, is that there is a pre-cancer phase to it. So it's very important because if the pre-cancer is detected, we can treat it and try and prevent cancer developing. Um, it's what we call vulval intraepithelial neoplasia, or VIN, so this is the pre-cancer po um, portion. If we leave pre-cancer alone, um, no treatment at all, then it can spontaneously go away in about 1.2% of all cases. Um, again, that's with someone that's got a good immune system that's fighting off any abnormal cells. Unfortunately, in about 3 to 16% of cases, um, it can progress on to become cancer. And over a number of years, that's 5 to 10 years. So again, ample amount of time to also pick these things up and try and prevent um, cancer from developing. It is predominantly seen in older women, as we said, but about 15% seen in those under the age of 50. And it can actually affect multiple areas of the vulva, not just one discrete area. And that may be at the same time, or it may be over a period of time. So you may have an area um, of pre-cancer today, it's treated or observed, and then you know, a few years' time, another area develops um, somewhere else on, on the vulva. So the next image I'm going to show is an example of um, pre-cancer and what it tends to look like. Um, and it's this white area here. Um, which gives us a sign that there, there is some abnormality there and that it's a precancer. And the idea of it occurring in different places, again, there's a second area here down by the perineum um, of that, of that precancer. So how do we treat it? Um, typically, it's topical ointments or creams that are put directly onto the vulva or onto the lesion. So Aldara is a cream that boosts the immune response, so it just helps the body to fight off all of these abnormal cells that are present. We may use chemotherapy, so 5-FU is a type of topical ointment that can, again, be put onto the skin. The idea behind chemotherapy, it tends to kind of um, attack or, or, or treat um, rapidly dividing or abnormally dividing cells. Now, with both the Aldara cream and the chemotherapy um, ointment, it can cause a lot of skin irritation. Um, peeling, pain, can give you flu-like symptoms as well. And it's often long courses of treatment, so we're talking six weeks, 16 weeks even. Um, so it does rely on the patient, you know, having to use the, the creams correctly, 
but also ensuring that they're not having too severe side effects because that will also limit whether they're using the creams or, or not and how successful treatment will be. Other options are to remove the abnormal tissue itself, so surgical excision. So again, either under local or general anaesthetic to um, take away that small area of abnormality. Or ablation, which is basically disruption of the, of the surface or of the um, abnormal tissue. And that may be via laser surgery, for example. So the risk factors for vulval cancer or even the precancers as well, um, again, are anything which dampens down the immune system or the body's ability to fight off any kinds of infections or the abnormal cells. So smoking is a big one because um, it reduces the immune system and the, and the body's ability to repair um, any damage. Steroids, so steroids in the context of patients who have um, quite chronic illnesses, um, for example, someone who's asthmatic, maybe on steroid inhalers, for example, sometimes tablets if it's quite um, severe. Um, someone with arthritis or any other inflammatory um, disease, chronic inflammatory disease may need to take steroids. The idea behind that is it dampens down the immune system, but again, unfortunately, puts at risk of these types of um, cancers. Organ transplants, so kidney, liver transplants. Um, these patients are often given medications to help um, prevent the rejection of the transplanted organ. Um, and again, the idea is it dampens down the immune system. HIV, so the virus responsible for the development of AIDS, again, that's reducing your immune system. And inheritance in terms of genetics and gene inheritance does play a very small role um, in, in, in increasing your risk of, of vulval cancers. So what may be some of the symptoms or appearances of the vo of vulval cancer? First one may be a lump. You just feel um, a mass or a lump in, in the vulva. Some bleeding, so again, we're thinking about women that are over the age of 65 largely, so any abnormal bleeding really from the genital tract should be investigated. Itching is quite a common one, quite intractable, severe itching, particularly at night. It doesn't seem to be helped by any um, creams or emollients. Going along with that pain and also burning sensation. And lastly, there may be a um, mass that appears in the groin. So similar to when you have a sore throat or flu, for example, you may have some lymph glands that develop in the neck. Um, and that's kind of the body's trying to react and try and fight off any of the infection. You have lymph glands in the groin as well. Now, in the context of vulval cancer, if there are some lymph glands in the groin, it may very well be that the body's trying to fight off the abnormal cells but it may um, be a sign that actually the cancer has spread to a gland in the groin. Um, so one of the presentations, as well as the other symptoms, is that the lady may feel a mass within, within her groin. So the next few images are of vulval cancer. So again, if you're feeling very squeamish, please look away now. Um, so this first set of images, this one is a magnification of this lesion here. And what you can see, it's, so this is at the top of um, the vagina, just to orientate, sorry, the vagina's here, the vulva at the top here, um, and the perineum down here. So um, this is just to illustrate, it's a, a raised um, lump that's quite red, it may be quite painful, um, and on touching that, it may bleed as well. And just next to it, it's almost looking like an ulcer, so that's more of a crater than a raised lump, um, and these can be quite painful as well. And somewhere around here will be the urethra. So when you're passing urine, and urine's quite acidic, you can imagine how that could touch that area and cause a lot of burning and stinging on passing urine as well. The second image is more of an extensive um, tumour, an extensive cancer of the vulva, um, quite irregular edges. It may be even be similar to the images that I showed you about of the vulval warts. Um, but if you had a look enough and sort of with a trained eye, you can tell a difference between what is warts and what is, um, what is an, a, a cancer. But again, the irregular edges really and quite extensive, but also, you know, different um, smaller areas throughout the vulva as well. So how do we diagnose vul vulval cancers? Ideally, we need to take a small sample or a biopsy. Um, and how we do this is via vul vulvoscopy. So this piece of equipment here is actually a colposcope. You may um, see it being used in the context of having a look at the cervix. The idea is that it provides magnification. 
Um, and so we can have a look at the vulva under high power or high magnification, particularly for the smaller tumours or the ones that you're not quite sure, is it a precancer, is it a cancer or not? And then it just aids us to be able to take a small sample from that. Um, you may want to do an ultrasound scan of the groin. Um, so again, if there is a lump there or suspicious that um, the groin may be involved, the cancer may have spread to the groin, we can do a scan and even take some samples from, um, from the lymph node in the groin as well and see if, there, if cancer has spread to there. And of course, MRI and CT scans are just to see has the cancer spread anywhere else, um, whether throughout the body or throughout the, the lower part of the abdomen, the pelvis. So treatment of um, vulval cancers is largely surgical um, and it does depend on location and size of the tumour as well. So if, for example, you have a small tumour similar to the um, earlier uh, images that I showed you just there on the uh, labia, what we aim to do is what we call a wide local excision, which is basically to take away that bit of the tumour, but also with normal tissue on either side so we know that we've removed all of it and there's less of a risk of, of it coming back um, or spreading elsewhere. If you have, oops, if you have a slightly larger tumour, so let's say on this side, um, then your incision would need to be bigger essentially and it may involve um, removing the majority of one side um, of the vulva so what we call a partial vulvectomy or partial removal of the vulva. And again, it's removing with enough normal tissue around it to make sure you've completely got the tumour. Um, again, if a tumour is quite large, there is a higher risk that it would go to the groin. So we also do a small incision in the groin um, to be able to sample any or take away the lymph nodes that may be affected by cancer. Um, and then lastly, if you have maybe a bigger tumour that goes right across both vulvas or in multiple areas, um, you may have to remove all of the vulva um, in totality. So we're talking something, something like that. Um, what we call a radical vulvectomy or removal of all of the vulva. And again, sampling um, the lymph nodes in the groin as well. Can you imagine it's quite extensive surgery? Um, and oftentimes we operate with the plastic surgeons so that they do reconstruction of the vulval area. Um, and it tends to be skin, fat, muscle, tissue from either the inner thighs or from the buttocks that are moved in um, to try and reconstruct that, that area after surgery. So treatment, as I said, the idea is to remove all of the disease, including the surrounding normal tissue to prevent any spread may require reconstruction if the surgery is quite extensive. Complications do include infection um, and wound breakdown. If you can imagine that area, you know, um, you've got your underwear on, you've got, um, you know, maybe trousers on. It's quite a moist area. It's a, it's a rich area for, for bacteria overgrowth. But also the act of walking, mobilising, sitting up and down um, can disrupt the wound. Um, so oftentimes there is, there is wound breakdown as a complication. Lymphedema is um, essentially swelling um, of the leg because of where we've sampled the lymph nodes, the fluid um, then leaks and tracks down via gravity underneath the skin and, and into the sort of the fat layers. And it gives this large swollen leg. And this leg will be quite heavy. And when, again, we're talking about elderly women, so it'll be quite difficult for them to mobilize and get around and walk around. Um, we can give stockings to help to encourage the flow. Um, they can be give, shown massage, how to encourage lymph flow. Um, but it's very, very difficult to treat lymphedema once it's got to this sort of stage. There are, of course, problems with urine incontinence and inability to hold on to the urine and also urine infections. And massive psychosocial, um, psychosocial and psychosexual um, issues and problems as well post-surgery. If a tumour is very large or quite advanced or it's spread to other parts of the body, it may be that radiotherapy is used just to shrink the tumour down, and that can be given in conjunction with chemotherapy as well. So survival, what does survival look like following treatment from um, vulval cancer? Now, all cancers are staged, depending on how far they've spread or not. Um, staging system of one to four, essentially. 
Um, and when we look at survival of cancers, we usually do it over a five-year period as well. How many women after diagnosis and treatment um, are still alive at, at the end of, uh, of year five or a five-year period? So looking at stage one, so this is where the tumour is just in the vulva itself, hasn't spread anywhere else, over 90% of women will be alive at five years. If you look going down to stage four, um, so this is spread, the tumour has spread more extensively, um, about 15% of women um, will be alive at five years. But overall, in terms of whichever staging um, they're presenting, about 75% of women who are diagnosed with vulval cancer and treated will be alive at five years. So can we actually prevent vulval cancer from happening in the first place? Um, I would propose self-examination is quite important in the same way we have the drive about examining um, females examining the breasts and looking out for any lumps about being worried about breast cancer. Um, I think it's important to kind of um, know what's normal for, for a woman, whether it be monthly mirror examination to have a look, is there any discoloration, any lumps, anything that's abnormal. Um, in the shower, having a feel, again, is there anything that's, um, that's different to, to what's normal, anything that's new? And then, of course, reporting that to GP or healthcare provider um, once those symptoms are, have been picked up. And also important um, for, if there's any healthcare providers, GPs in the audience, um, to be aware of the symptoms, but also if you've given treatment like steroids, for example, or emollients, um, and patients are still coming with intense itching, intense burning, and it's not going away, thinking about referring in um, to gynecology quite early so that we can take biopsies and see um, exactly what's happening. Of course, stopping smoking, as I said, smoking was a big risk factor for the development of the pre-cancers as well as the cancers, so stopping smoking um, would help to reduce that. Um, and even if there is a diagnosis of a precancer, um, again, stopping smoking may help for um, the, the precancer to regress or get better, um, sometimes without any necessarily any treatment, and certainly stopping it from progressing to full-blown cancer. And protecting against HPV, again, we mentioned HPV is one of the causes of vulval cancer. Um, now, condoms... Um, to use condoms, although it doesn't completely prevent infection. Um, as I said, it is a kind of skin-to-skin -skin contact as well in the way in that it's spread. And um, vaccination. So at the moment, the vaccine on the market is Gardasil. Um, this is a HPV vaccine that it protects against four different subtypes of HPV. So subtypes 6 and 11, which are the ones that cause the warts, and 16 and 18, which are the high-risk ones thought to cause cancer. It's currently given as part of the school program um, for adolescent girls, so girls aged 12 to 13, and it's more for the cervical um, cancer program rather than vulval. However, as we've said, because HPV, there's a portion of um, vulval cancer caused by HPV, we would expect that vaccination should also protect against some of the vulval cancers that are caused by HPV as well, um, so it has that, that benefit. Gardasil 9 is the newer vaccination that's on the market at the moment. I don't think it's necessarily given as part of the programme, but it does protect against m more of the subtypes of HPV, so greater protection from HPV infection. And there are also studies that are looking at whether we can use the vaccine as a treatment for someone who has a precancerous lesion. Um, so they've already developed HPV of some sort. Could the vaccine boost their immune system and help them to fight off the infection that they already have? Um, or certainly protect them against other HPV um, infections that may cause them to develop precancers. Um, and we've actually just recently published a, um, a paper looking into that as well, um, the role of the vaccine for, for treatment um, not for those who already have precancers. So just to engage everyone a little bit and keep everyone a little bit awake, just a bit of a spot diagnosis type quiz, just a show of hands. Um, I am going to show some abnormal vulvas again, and it's just a case, again, a show of hands whether you think it's cancer or not. So first one, who thinks it's cancer? Not cancer. Okay, it's not cancer, it's lichen sclerosis. Um, so this is the inflammatory condition that we were talking about. Um, although about 5% of women can go on to develop cancer from it. Next one, cancer. 
Yeah, pretty much all. Apart from that. <laughs> and yeah, no, exactly. This is a cancer. So um, the typical um, raised lesion as well as an ulcer, which may be quite painful. It may bleed as well. Anyone thinks this is cancer? Not cancer. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a vulval um, abscess. So again, under local anaesthetic or general anaesthetic, incision, release the pus, antibiotics are given. <laughs> And in the last image, he thinks it's cancer. Okay. He thinks not cancer. Okay, fine. It's a bit of a tricky one. So this is the pre-cancer. So this is the VIN. Um, again, it, it can be difficult. Sometimes the only way that you can tell between the two is taking that biopsy. So it's about recognizing that there is something abnormal there. We need to take a biopsy. We need to find out what it is. So, in summary, vulval cancer is a rare disease. Um, the signs and symptoms can be intense itching, burning, maybe a lump, maybe a mole or skin discoloration. Very important to seek um, early care because, as I said, precancerous changes can be treated before it develops into cancer. The mainstay of treatment would be surgery um, with the idea to remove all of the disease and reduce the risk of the cancer returning. And the HPV vaccine, we hope, that's been used for the prevention of cervical cancer, we hope should reduce the incidence of some of the vulval cancers as well. And really, the take-home message is to not be afraid to talk about the vulva, not be afraid to examine the vulva, um, learn what's normal so then you can spot abnormal, and to love your labia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. So if there are any questions, I think there's some, are there any roving microphones? No, I'll, I'll, I'll run around. Has anyone got a question? Hi. Um, you said earlier that uh, only about 20% total, 1% cleared up with the precancerous cells with mm -hmm. about 16. So what happens to the other 80%? Does it turn into a chronic disease or...? It can, the pre-cancers, you mean, yeah. yeah, it can turn into a, a chronic disease that needs just kind of regular follow-up um, and just making sure that it doesn't, um, you know, develop into um, a full-blown cancer. Um, again, as I said, pre-cancers can be treated. Unfortunately, they're not completely cured. They can recur, but certainly these women go and undergo regular follow-ups. Have you found that this is more or less likely with women who've had to suffer FGM? Because that must complicate everything. Oh, I'm going to defer to Azim. Who I'm, I'm not aware of here, FGM as being a risk factor for it, um, but certainly it would be worse news for a patient to develop a precancerous condition because you've got less healthy skin to play with at that point. One of the great things about operating on the vulva is that it's the most elastic skin in the body because it has to deal with childbirth. So you can actually get away with removing surprisingly large areas and getting a very good cosmetic and therefore one also hopes functional results, by which I mean that the patient feels the vulva doesn't look so different despite having a bit removed and also that it still enables her to enjoy sex. Um, if you've already had an FGM, depending on how um, severe the FGM was, there may be very little skin left behind. And then surgically it becomes much harder to treat and you would need to involve plastic surgery at an earlier stage. Um, well, involve them in cases when otherwise you wouldn't have needed to, to bring in fresh skin from the buttock or the thigh to replace uh, the abnormal skin that you've had to remove. So FGM, not a known risk factor, but would certainly make treatment more difficult in those women who are unfortunate enough to get it. Question at the back there. Am I right in thinking that lichen sclerosis can be linked to other autoimmune diseases, such as thyroid and other things? Exactly, like yeah. So you may want to um, investigate whether there are other autoimmune disorders as well in that particular patient. And I was quite surprised yes. that the HPV rate was lower. Working in colposcopy, our HPV rate is very high mm -hmm. in comparison to cervical mm -hmm. cancer, whereas your rate was around 16 
percent is it uh, 30 to 40 30 to 40 it's still quite in, involved yeah, exactly not, high, it's lower it? compared to to um cervix so where you've yeah. got hpv and say lichen sclerosis the rest of it is just developing for no known reason or yeah essentially yeah I think you mentioned that you was doing research or published an article on the therapeutic use of the vaccination for, for uh, people with HPV. Could you talk a bit more about this? Yeah, sure. Um, so what we were looking to find, as I said, because the treatments at the moment for the pre-cancers, um, the side effects, the issues we were worried about, number one, even if we're removing the um, actual lesion as well, it can come back, so the lady may have to undergo another surgery. So actually, could the vaccine help um, to either, number one, boost the immune system um, to help them fight off naturally the, um, the infection or the precancerous changes, or certainly prevent them from developing other HPV types, which may put you more at risk of developing precancer changes. The vaccines that are being used are experimental type vaccines, so they're different to the vaccine that's available on the market at the moment, and it's just to do with the way um, in which the for it's being formulated um, to be used as a treatment rather than as a preventative measure. Um, and from our research, um, we've shown that, I know there, there was one particular paper that showed that in about 60% um, of women who were given the vaccine um, with precancerous changes, they did see a regression, certainly in the symptoms of itching that they had, certainly in the sizes of the lesions that they have, but it doesn't necessarily cure it altogether. Um, but it was more looking into, is this an alternative for treatment um, rather than what's out there at the moment? Any final questions? Okay, well, I think that's the end of today's lunch hour lecture, but I'd like you all to join me please in thanking Dr. Stacey Bryan for a very illuminating lecture.